Welcome to note set number 13. We're going to continue our discussion about the Fourier transform, but in particular some of its properties. So these properties help us understand how to apply this and how to expand our knowledge of Fourier transforms. Um, so it helps us apply our table to an even wider class of signals, um, but it helps us understand how these things are used in various applications. Um, so this may seem just like boring math, but let me tell you, if you're going to be working out in the area of like cell phones or radars, MP3 processing, data compression, um, audio, um, you know, these are the tools that such engineers use really on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so there is a table on the web page and um, has a complete list of properties. Um, so we'll talk about some of those properties in more detail than others. Um, so you should be familiar with all the tables or with all the properties. Um, so uh, here we're going to learn some of the most important properties. Uh, and then in the next note set, we'll explore um, how we actually use those properties to do some interesting things. So linearity, this one is the most important of all. Um, this isn't linearity of systems. It's the fact that um, the Fourier transform is based upon an integral. And integrals are linear, meaning an integral of a sum is equal to the sum of the individual integrals. Um, so basically that just says if I've got one signal and I know it's Fourier transform, I've got another signal and I know it's Fourier transform and I want to know the Fourier transform of a linear combination of X and Y, well it's just that same linear combination of their individual Fourier transforms. So this thing um, is just, it's used so often that you sometimes end up forgetting that you're actually using it. So another way to write this property is that the Fourier transform of this, we can just pass the Fourier transform through the sum, through the constants, um, and um, that's how we have that. Um, so it's really easy to see. We end up with this linear combination inside an integral, um, but then, you know, standard property of the integral of sum uh, you know, when, where the integrand is a sum of things allows us to break this into two parts, um, and that's the basic idea. Time shift. Uh, this one shows up so much in audio, communications, radar, etc. Um, in my research, this is something that, that I use, uh, you know, virtually every day. Um, so the basic idea is suppose you know what the Fourier transform of some signal is, but now you have it delayed. Um, or advanced, but we'll focus on delay here. Uh, so if C is greater than zero, we're talking about delaying the signal. So obviously delays happen in audio um, and communications and radar all the time when a signal um, takes one uh, direct path to you, but then also uh, bounces off a, a ceiling or a wall or something. Uh, and so that, that reflect or that path takes longer for the signal to get to you um, and so that's why this is such an important property. Um, so uh, the basic idea here uh, that we see is that um, the Fourier transform of a delayed signal is the original signal's Fourier transform having trouble with my pen again. I don't know why when I get up into that region. Uh, but then there's also this e to the minus j c, c omega. Um, so what does that mean? Well, notice that if we take the, the magnitude um, of this new result, uh, that the magnitude wrapped around that e to the minus j term just becomes 1. Uh, so that goes away, and therefore, um, the effect of a delay doesn't change how much of what we need. And that kind of makes sense. Shifting a signal shouldn't change how much of sinusoids we need. We just need to shift the sinusoids. Well, this thing is imparting the appropriate phase shifts necessary to, um, necessary to bring that um, shift to the, exactly the right position. So it shifts all the 
sinusoidal components to just the right time shift um, so that it imparts this appropriate delay. Uh, and so what does that look like? Well, we take the angle, uh, the angle of this uh, new Fourier transform. The angle of a product is the sum of the angles. Um, so we have the original Fourier transform's angle. The angle of this thing is just, um, uh, okay, I have a little typo here. This should be negative sign. So let me fix that. This should be negative C W or C omega. So what we do is we take the the original Fourier transforms phase and we add a slope of negative uh, we add a line with slope of negative C to that um, so that's that's what we're we're doing here so um, uh, a way to say this in words is a shift of t of a time uh, signal causes a linear phase shift of the frequency components uh, the, the linear part says that that phase shift that's added is a line. Time scaling, this is a, a fairly important um, property. This accounts for the fact that when um, you send a signal out and it bounces off a moving target that um, there is some effect on the frequency components where they lie. Um, so it actually changes the frequency components um, that you would receive back. Um, so that's that's one thing. It also accounts for the fact that if you play a, a, a tape recorder faster, it, you get higher pitch sounds, and if you play a tape recorder slower, you get lower pitch sounds. Um, so you know the bottom line is scaling in time. So by changing t to a t, we do the reciprocal scaling in in frequency um, so um, that's a, a an interesting result and uh, it's called a duality so here's the basic idea of of scaling um, suppose this is our original signal and we're going to time scale it with a equals to two um, what that does is it compresses the signal in uh, that's because um, when t is equal to one uh, we're really looking at x of 2t uh, when a is equal to 2. So when t is equal to 1 for this signal, we're really looking back at x equal to 2. Um, so um, everything gets compressed in um, on itself. It squishes, to use a quote-unquote technical term, uh, squishes the signal into a shorter duration. Um, on the other hand, if we were to use a scaling factor less than one, uh, this now stretches the, the, the signal out. So um, A's uh, with magnitude greater than one makes our signal wiggle faster. Therefore, um, we need, uh, it makes sense that we would need more high frequencies um, to represent that signal. On the other hand, uh, an A whose magnitude is less than one stretches the signal out and the signal will then wiggle slower than it did originally um, and so then um, it would need um, less of the high frequencies um, so we, we would expect uh, a corresponding change in the Fourier transform. So let's take a look um, for a specific signal uh, maybe one that looks like that, and this is its original Fourier transform. Um, doesn't really matter where I got those results, um, but now what we're going to do is take a look at um, if we um, compress the signal in time, so we, we squish it together in time, we see that this thing expands out. Um, it get, gets lower in the center, but we now have more stuff out here than we did before. Um, so um, notice that squishing in in the time domain stretches out in the frequency domain. And likewise, if we start with the same original signal and we stretch it out in the time domain, so now we're stretching in the time domain, we're actually squishing in uh, in the frequency domain. We we need uh, we don't need as much high frequency content to represent this slower moving signal. 
So those are ways to think about this. Um, and this rule of thumb uh, kind of captures that. Um, and we, so we've seen this already when we looked at the e to the minus bt times u of t um, signal. And we saw that when we chose b to make that thing decay really fast in the time domain, that it spread out really wide in the frequency domain. So what that's telling us is um, that uh, when we increase duration, uh, like this, we're decreasing bandwidth. So bandwidth just means kind of the range where um, we have significant frequency content. And likewise, when we decrease duration, we are increasing bandwidth. So very short signals tend to take up a wide width in, in the frequency band. Um, and that's precisely why, uh, you, you know, you might realize that um, uh, the challenges of sending high-speed data um, over cables. We talked about how we can model a cable as a RC circuit. Um, so that RC circuit, we've already also seen that that suppresses high frequencies when we studied that example of the full wave rectifier. So um, as we try to send data faster, we're making our signal wiggle faster. Um, shorter duration pulses to send each bit. Um, therefore, we are uh, necessarily um, taking up a wider bandwidth. And that's why a certain cable or a certain uh, you know, wireless network uh, can only send data at a certain rate. And if you want to send it faster, um, you typically need more bandwidth to do that. Uh, that's also why people tend to talk about higher data rates as being higher bandwidth signals. Kind of a misuse of the term, um, but there is some logic behind why it's called that. Okay, time reversal, just a special case of time scaling with A equal to minus 1. So we just apply the result and, and, and um, we get that. Um, so just a, a, a little notice here, what is x of minus omega? Well, it just flips it around uh, vertically around the axis, um, well, horizontally around uh, around the, the omega equal to zero axis. But let's take a look at mathematically what that means. So we're putting in a negative omega there. That means we need to put in a negative omega there. Um, into our definition of the Fourier transform. Um, but now what we're going to do, um, so th then this negative and this negative combine and we get the positive. But now we're going to put in a double conjugate. So a bar over the top often means conjugation. So if I conjugate and then conjugate again, I've done nothing, right? Conjugate once, change the sign on J. Conjugate again, change the sign on J, and I'm right back to where I started. So there's no change there. So this is just a little trick um, that we're going to do here. Um, but now we're going to start grouping that conjugation. So we're going to take the first conjugation inside the integral and break it between the two things. That's perfectly legitimate. Um, and so now when we conjugate this, we get the minus j. When we conjugate x of t, we're going to assume that x of t is, is real valued here. So if x of t is real valued, um, conjugating it does nothing to it. So we're, we're good there. Uh, and so then we're still left with one conjugation. So for a real signal, reversing um, the signal just conjugates the Fourier transform. And really all that does is it changes the phases. It kind of flips the phase function around. That's basically all it really does. Um, so conjugating the, the, the angle of, of the conjugate Fourier transform is just the negative of the phase. So it just flips it upside down. That's all it does. Now we're getting into the real workhorses of modern technology. Um, you use your cell phone, you receive a signal, um, or you're listening to a station on the radio, uh, but somebody else is listening to the radio and they're listening to a different station. How is it that you're both using radio frequencies, but you're able to listen to two separate things? Um, the modulation property helps us understand that. Also, how is it that we can get a voice signal to propagate all the way over to somewhere else. Um, modulation property 
uh, tells us all about that. Uh, this is super important for areas like communications and radar and things like that. So there's two different forms, one form for multiplying by a complex exponential and one form for modulating by a real sinusoid. Um, but they're related. And Euler's form, uh, Euler's formula connects these two um, uh, so we can use the complex exponential form uh, to uh, help us analyze real-world cases even though it isn't directly applicable there. So let's start with the complex exponential form. So what are we doing? We're taking some given signal and we're multiplying it by a complex sinusoid. Complex exponential, complex sinusoid, same thing, just different names for the same thing. And what effect does this multiplication have in the frequency domain? It shifts it, shifts the whole thing over to a whole new region of frequencies. So if this is our original Fourier transform, the effect of modulation in the frequency domain is it moves it. It was located here, it's now moved up to a higher frequency. Um, okay, now we're starting to see how we can move signals around to different frequency bands. So when you're tuning your radio, you're tuning it to you know, 99.1, you're getting the signal that somebody has moved and centered at 99.1. Then you tune to 103.7, whatever that is. Well, somebody else has moved something up to 103.7, uh, some other frequency. So this property allows us to move things around. Now, unfortunately, we see that this thing now has lost its symmetry. So we can't have a real valued signal anymore. For this case, no kidding, we took a real valued signal X, multiplied it by a complex thing, so it's no longer real. Um, but we do have some ways of dealing with that. So uh, the real sinusoidal modulation case helps us deal with that. Um, Euler, linearity, and the property we just learned are the three things that help us deal with that. So take a signal, multiply it by a cosine, and what ends up happening, break that into Euler's form. Um, and what we see here is uh, we now have the positive frequency and the negative frequency part, each individually multiplying x of t. Now we're going to pass the Fourier transform through. This is the linearity property. And we have that. But we, we know that. This is the complex exponential property. We know that. So this thing shifts it that way this thing shifts it that way and so what's really going on the final result is that in the time domain multiplication by a cosine shifts frequencies down and shifts frequencies up now you might be saying ha he did another typo down versus plus shouldn't that be up no 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 check it out plus omega zero with omega zero being positive shifts to the left. With a positive omega zero and I have negative omega zero, it shifts to the right. So we're talking about shifting up and shifting down. Um, now related result for sine, we get the same basic idea. It's just we have a negative sign and we've got a J out in front. Now you should be able to use these two ideas and figure out what that thing looks like. It's on the properties table, but you should be able to figure it out on your own. So let's visualize what this is doing. We'll stick with the cosine form. Um, so it takes the original spectrum, shifts it up, shifts it down. So if this is our original spectrum, now we're looking at the spectrum of this modulated signal. And so we have the shifted down version, and we have the shifted up version. Um, and I'm showing a large enough shift so that this edge doesn't overlap with that edge. Um, not necessarily true, but in most practical scenarios, that's the case that we're looking at. Um, so this is very interesting. It tells us how to move a signal spectrum up to higher frequencies. Now notice that in this case, we do retain the symmetry in positive and negative frequencies. Um, so we're, we're all set. X of t times cosine is a um, is a 
real valued signal. So this is what's happening in in the real world. So what is this thing good for? Well, like I already said, radio stations use this to get signals up to higher frequencies, high enough that they'll actually propagate, they'll radiate from the antenna and actually propagate through the airwaves. Um, low frequency signals, audio range frequencies, don't propagate, they don't radiate as well. Um, they do a little bit, but not very much at all. Um, but if we get them up to high frequencies in the megahertz, gigahertz, then these things are going to radiate from the antenna and propagate across the airwaves to be received by a an, uh, receiving antenna um, and then undone. We undo uh, what we just did. Now, here's a, an important property that I mentioned, um, but we're not really um, going to discuss it in detail until much, much later. Um, but it's this right-hand side that is the most important. Um, and, and we've already seen this idea of uh, a system frequency response multiplying something um, at a, as an input to give us an output. That's, that's what this property is really about, but we're going to just gloss over this thing right now. Um, we saw Parseval's result for um, Fourier series. We have a Parseval's result uh, Parseval's theorem for the Fourier transform. Very much the same except now we're integrating from minus infinity to infinity uh, something squared. So this is actually giving us the energy, total energy in the signal. And we can compute the total energy in the frequency domain as well. Um, so that um, gives us the energy computed in the time domain. Uh, this is the energy at time t, uh, and this is the energy at frequency omega, and so we're just accumulating those up through through the integral. Um, and so this Parseval's theorem gives us a way of looking at the Fourier transform and finding out how much energy is there in certain regions of frequency. Uh, a very useful result. Now this one's a little bit tricky. It's called the duality property, um, and and basically it's it's based upon the fact that you know if we look at the machine that's doing the transforming and the inverse transforming, the machine is very much the same. Multiply by a complex exponential, complex sinusoid, um, and integrate. Um, so the the machine is very much the same, uh, and therefore we would expect um, that there's a if there's a time to frequency property we would expect a similar frequency to time property so um, let me give you a, an illustration of that notice the delay property we've talked about that so if I delay in the time it means multiplication by this complex exponential in the frequency domain and we interpreted that as adding a linear phase but nonetheless it's multiplication by a complex sinusoid or complex exponential. Now we also saw the modulation property. Shifting in the frequency domain corresponds to multiplication by a complex exponential in the time domain. So um, look at that. We can see the duality there. Um, doing one thing in the time domain uh, gives us something in the frequency domain. Doing the first thing in the frequency domain gives us the second thing in the time domain. Um, so very interesting idea and good to keep an eye on that as, as you learn about Fourier transforms. So some other dual, dual properties that we haven't really talked too much about um, are there. Just keep your eye out for those things. They can uh, really be helpful as you are learning how to do these things. Now this duality structure gives us one last thing that's pretty cool. Um, it allows us to create new pairs on our table uh, if they're not already there. Um, so the, you know, there's some words here that describe it, but the best thing to do is to just show an example. So we found a rectangular pulse has a Fourier transform that is a sync function. Let's apply these two steps. So step number one says, take the thing on the right hand side of the existing pair, um, take the omega 
out and replace it with t, right? Replace omega by t uh, and then move it over to the time domain. So everything stays the same except now we've got a t here where we had an omega. That's step number one. Step number two says take whatever was on the time side of your original one, uh, replace t by minus omega, and multiply by 2 pi. So there's the multiplying by 2 pi. I'm going to take t, replace it by minus omega, but here I've used the fact that our pulse, our rectangle, is an even function. So flipping it with the negative omega does nothing, so we can just remove the negative sign. So what this tells us, very important result, Rectangle in the time domain, sync function in the frequency domain, sync function in the time domain, rectangle in the frequency domain. So if we were to um, look at a time function, that's a sync function, this is time, what does it look like in the frequency domain? In the frequency domain, it's a rectangle. And so that is a very interesting result that will pop up when we start talking about using linear time invariant systems to filter out certain frequencies. And we'll get to that very soon. Okay, um, we'll see you next time. Thanks.